Hello, I am Paul Shercliffe from Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. Shirky17 on Twitter, if you're there. I've been in education for 25 years, mostly as a mathematics and physics teacher. But now I kind of really consider myself more as a maker educator. And I would like to help everyone get a little more maker into their learning experiences. So that's what I'm going to work on today. Welcome to Spark 21. Hope you're having a great day. I appreciate that you're going to spend some time with me. There's my contact information. You could pause now. I'll bring it up later again also. I will talk a bit about maker-centered learning. MCLs sometimes for short. You know, a conversation would be better so I kind of know where you're coming from, what thoughts you have, what questions you need answered, but we can do that later if you want. Just contact me. And I'm going to use snowflakes as an example of how maker-centered learning can be utilized in many subject areas. Then I'll talk a little bit more about MCL, and then I will go into some design options that I uh, did with my students. I did this with some seventh graders, got some interesting things. Um, I don't have any examples of those because I was doing it as a long-term sub and I don't have access to that Google Drive anymore. Uh, then I'll talk about some materials and tools. There's a whole spectrum of those and we're barely going to scratch the surface. But I'll let you see how uh, we utilize some things. And then I will wrap up the presentation. Maker-centered learning, sometimes is known as maker ed or maker spaces. But those are really just pieces to the whole MCL picture. It's really a mindset, a mentality uh, that you develop, and it takes time to develop it. And I believe it's the way that we learn best. It has the making of something at the core of the experience. It's not an offshoot. It's not just a special, not just for the kids who get done. Uh, it's not just the end of the project or if we have time. You know, it eventually becomes th that culture. And there's a culture of just, you know, once you start creating, designing, it, there's limitless possibilities. MCL is not new. It is a mashup of all those good pedagogies that we've learned about. Dewey, Montessori, Papert, Piaget, Vygotsky. Um, it's not an add-on. It's not something more to put on your plate. It really is just an approach to learning. There are many verbs and gerunds that go along with make making. So you got all these words. The ones I like best are tinkering and iterating, tinker and iterate. Um, this can be done digitally or analog. You can play with paper and pencil or if you got a laser cutter. You start with what you have. You And then you research how you might expand what is available to your students. You uh, start asking for donations. You, you start finding other materials. Kids come up with ideas on what to use uh, to make and build with. This is not giving them a recipe and they all do the same thing and you get back 30 the same project. This involves student choice and voice. One great part about MCL is that you learn something about your students. And we've always talked about these relationships being important and building relationships and getting to know each other. And this is a great way because you learn something about them just from what they choose to make or from what they choose to make with. You learn about the students and they learn about you. Much of learning occurs in the conversations that you're going to have because this is not about lecture and telling him everything. This is about talking about ideas and the conversations you might have with the students but also the conversations that they have with each other that you overhear. The conversation is the place for you to weave in content coming from their point of view you know kind of they you got a conversation going with them about something and then you can hey well that's this content and here's these connections to it. Questions are a big part of learning and we all know that you ask them questions or they ask you questions or they just ask questions of the world kind of thing just how do i do this what do i make you don't have to answer all the questions you don't have to have the answers to the questions you help them form good questions and find ways to get the solutions 
we learned that questioning is a great thing to do in developing those skills. I believe that making and the ensuing discussions that you have activate both sides of the brain and builds a bridge between them. And this helps create better pathways and the making of more connections. It really is, expands our learning possibilities. I also feel that the making of some artifact, having a physical entity, anchors the learning in our brain and makes it easier for recall. The making of something carries a piece of our, ourselves with it, which gives it emotion. And emotion amplifies learning. Now, I'm going to be talking about snowflakes because I did this um, with seventh graders. And besides me learning about the students and them learning some things about science because we were talking science, they were finding out about the learning process involved and the iteration. Um, I would always push them to try something more, do a little better, make it a little bit more complex, try a different tool. Tell me about the tools. It wasn't just a get it done and turn it in. Obviously, you have to decide how much you're going to push your students and which students uh, you want to push which way because every kid is different. I would like you to think about a couple things while I talk about snowflakes. What artifact could your students be making? What topics are you doing? What, what could be related to those topics? They don't all have to be making the same thing. What is related to the content that we want to learn? What discussions could we have branching off from this artifact? What kind of connections could I make to the world? Also, you have to think about you know, what materials and tools can my students use? You know, if you're studying the Mayan civilization, what would be a great thing for them to design and build that you could have all the conversations you need to have? If you're studying Don Quixote, what could they work with? Basically, what could be a physical manifestation representation of our content ideas that we can branch off from? Now, snowflakes have some obvious science connections. And yes, I was in science class doing it. There's weather, climate change, phase changes, elements, chemical formulas, water cycle, crystals. We can talk about all that stuff. And that's what's nice about it. They also have a lot of mathematics to them. We talk about angles. We talk about symmetry. Talk about rotations, reflections. Yes, all snowflakes have six-fold symmetry. And you got to... When they make them a design, they have to have that. They can't have five. There are Latin prefixes that you could be working in there. That six-fold symmetry, the six-sided shape is a hexagon. What's a five-sided shape? What's an eight-sided shape? What's a 12-sided shape? You can ask them questions, get them to, to think more than just what we're dealing with. Snowflakes are also present in geography. How many places in the world have snow? Are you studying a place that has snow? That would be the best reason to, do, to uh, do snowflakes, not one that doesn't have snow. History is full of snow as a setting. Battles uh, that happened in uh, wintertime, snow impacted them maybe. Um, I even think of World War I, uh, the, the Christmas Eve battle where they sang Silent Night. Obviously there was, there was snow going on there and anything, any depiction I've ever seen of it has snow falling. There's expeditions to, through mountain passes, up to mountains, Arctic, Antarctic. American history, Valley Forge, the winter at Valley Forge with George Washington. Snow's kind of an important thing in that uh, realm. English language arts has connections also. There are poetry and stories by some famous authors. Might even be your favorite author. There are short stories, picture books. There are even stories that are classics that have snow as a setting. And that's okay if it's just a setting. It doesn't have to be a main theme. It's just giving us a place where we can branch off to have conversations. Here's a great point about maker-centered learning. Because that artifact that you're making can exist in many subjects, and sometimes you've got to think and look for it, you can have conversations about any and all the subjects making the connection between them. And we know that connected learning is, is the best learning. If you're in history class, you can be talking about Valley Forge, but you could also be talking about the math of snow to the kid who likes math. 
or you could be talking about the poetry or imagery of snow to the the kid who likes poems stories and art you don't have to have the same conversations with with each kid this makes it easier to weave in the content obviously you want to be talking the same subject matter content that you're trying to get to each kid but you, all the side stuff that opens the kids' brains, that comes from their point of view, comes from something that they like, that allows that conversation to be more open and get into them. It's from something they already picture. I kind of think of MCL as being trans-curricular, not just cross-curricular. I think trans is a better word in that I see it as blurring the boundaries between subjects and just kind of having it all there. Remember, most of the learning is going to happen in conversations, not in you telling everybody something. MCL goes beyond just content and connections. It fosters all the C's that people talk about as needing to develop in kids' curiosity, creativity, collaboration, community, communication, critical thinking, come up with any other C. It helps foster all those. There's also some I words that Nancy Penchev has put up in her iLab. And these are capital I words, and they are verbs. It helps with those also, and that gives you a better focus. And if you have not read it yet, Maker Center Learning is connected and kind of a branch of or part of the idea of Lifelong Kindergarten by Mitchell Resnick. It's promote, the idea of promoting learning through projects, passion, peers, and play. If we could all be in kindergarten again. Now I'll chat about some design ideas. You need, obviously need to think about what materials and tools you or your kids have available. Literally anything is a maker material. Give them options, as many as you want. I did 12 because it was getting close to it's Christmas. I did you know 12 days of snowflakes. That might have been too many. Ask them for options. Students often working are often working with uh, tools and materials that we hadn't thought of. It's okay to start with stuff that's well known and easy that they're, they're comfortable with. But you also want to push them to explore some new ones and, and build some new skills. Even if they don't do well with that new one, failure is okay. Because we learn something about the tool and say, okay, we'll get back to it later. But it's not really failure because you still had conversations about content and topics and learn about the students. You need to learn to value process over product. As much as you want a nice shiny product at the end, sometimes that doesn't always happen. Amazingly enough, none of my ideas in this example are going to involve cardboard, duct tape, batteries, or LEDs. Some of my uh, biggest go-tos. You don't have to give as many options, but give them some. And be open to students' ideas of options. Always about voice and choice. Many people are tactile, like to work with their hands and work with physical objects and building others. That's awesome. You might need to give them a template for the symmetry, whether it be six lines that are 60 degrees apart, or whether it be a hexagon, a regular hexagon. Regular meaning all the angles and all the sides are the same. Yes, the snowflakes have to have correct symmetry no matter what class you are in. There are a myriad of commercial building materials. Do you have any of these? Do the kids have any of these? It never hurts to start asking for donations from the community. You just have to have some way to store things. That's always a big issue in classrooms. Remember that anything is a maker material, so household items work. Silverware, cups, plates. I told the kids not to use the good china. Some kids are going to have a bunch of different lipstick containers. Some will have different uh, body sprays and spritzes that are all the same bottle. Kind of is in the same shape. So that works as part of their snowflake. Don't forget to hit the recycle bin. Just remember with all these extra materials, they have to have six of each one because of the six-fold symmetry. Upcycling and repurposing, 
of materials is a great practice to get them to learn. Craft items, always great. Many people usually have these. Not everybody does. That's always the hard part about making it home or making a school. We come to school because we have all the materials available. Not every kid at home has the same stuff. So you got to be aware of that. Some people kind of try to downplay Maker by saying, it's just crafts. You're just doing crafts. And one, I think they're wrong. It's not just crafts. We're designing, we're creating, we're, we're, we're making something. And two, what's the matter with crafts? Why would they try to downplay crafts people? The crafts people, they make the world such a better place. I am always amazed when I go to farmer's markets and, and see the things that people have, have created and come up with. That's a great skill to foster. You could even just print out some shapes for kids to cut out and piece together. Every kid is different. They all want to work with some different things. Some kids have amazing drawing skills, whether it be pencil or pen or marker or colored pencils. That's always got to be an option that they can draw because some of them are just astounding. I've seen kids in uh, this year in seventh grade. I saw some kids who could, who could literally be commercial art artists. There was just I just couldn't believe some of the details that they put. In the age of computers, there are always many virtual tools available to students. I try to find ones that are browser-based and free. They might have a login uh, to have an account, which is good because it saves work. Some students already have some paid tools because it's an interest of them. It's a, a hobby for them kind of thing. So be, be open for that. Remember those good old math manipulatives that we had in the classroom? Of course there are virtual sites for them. There are many virtual sites for them. Just Google virtual math manipulatives. GeoGebra.org is this awesome math website. And you can just use it for a simple basic thing of making shapes. It's got polygon tool, it's got line tool, segment tool, um, circle tool, if you want to add circles. And they can just make shapes, put them together. And yes, it has tools to rotate, so they can get that perfect symmetry that it can just copy the shape, paste it, and rotate the copy. Tinkercad.com is a great 3D design place, but you don't have to be 3D printing. You can just design things on it. And they got a whole slew of shapes, characters, images, letters, if they'd like to make a snowflake out of, out of words, that'd, that'd be fine, right? It's got a rotation tool in there, so yes, you can rotate, copy, paste, rotate. Works pretty good. Desmos.com is another awesome math tool. Now, this one's going to be a little bit more intensive in math because you have to write equations for lines. So it depends on grade level, depends on subject, depends on kid, pretty much. There's this neat thing called Desmos Art. Google it, Desmos Art. People just make amazing drawings. And if you look over on the left, there'll be these, this whole big list of equations that they use to make the drawings. Um, it's pretty interesting. Of course, there are some coding options. Tinkercad.com, back to that. It's a 3D design thing, but they have a section of it, a, a, a click a link to do what they call code blocks, which are you're creating designs, you're creating shapes with code. So here's an example of one that I had done. And yeah, you, you make a shape, you put it there, you give it some dimensions, you put it to certain places, you can rotate it. So that does some good work. And again, you don't have to 3D print it. Playful Intervention has a browser-based and a download of a thing called Turtle Art. Turtle Art is actually pretty old. It's a neat little thing. You got a turtle, you give it some instructions, and it traces lines as it moves. You tell it how to move, and it traces lines. Or it doesn't trace lines if you tell it to pick up the pen. EduBlocks is another turtle art. It's got Python, which is a turtle, which can do turtle art 
you see the, the red block there you have to import turtle um, so yeah they have a block based coding here's an example of mine this first that was just some setup stuff setting up screens setting up the names and then I I called it branch one and branch two but it was actually parts of one branch the inner part the outer part those would have been better names inner branch outer branch if I told the turtle move and go and turn and then at the end I told it make six of these and then here make six of this other part a nice thing about EduBlocks is they also have a, a, an icon there to click to see the Python, the text-based coding that is behind all the blocks. Now you can't actually type Python here and go back to see blocks. It doesn't do that. But they do have, if you start with Python, you can write in Python. You just can't go to blocks. Trinket is another browser-based thing, coding for Python. Now, this one is actually the text-based Python. It's not blocks. So if you got a kid that wants to do some Python, free accounts, sign in so you can save your work. They don't actually have a turtle, which is kind of boring, but hey. REPL, IT. REPL is another free browser-based coding kind of thing. Now, they actually have a whole slew of languages. I just happen to choose Python with Turtle to work with. I thought you might like to see the code, so I've got all the code for what it does. Um, I need to get better at documenting my code, and that's one thing to teach kids is you got to tell people what the lines of the code do. So this was all the code that it took to make that snowflake. Of course, there's lots of design software. You might already have some on your computers. Inkscape is a free download. It's a pretty awesome software. Adobe Illustrator, Corel Draw, those cost money. If you have a laser cutter in your school, you might have some software to run it. Some of them can do designs. Lightburn is an example of a software that runs lasers but also does some design. Here's an example in Lightburn. You make some shapes, you copy them, paste them, rotate them. So it has enough tools to do some of that. So now your students have created a bunch of snowflakes. You've got a you've had all your discussions that you need to have. What do you do? What do you do with these things? Well, first of all, definitely get pictures. Document it. Save them. Copy them. Whether they've done um, digital version, an analog version, uh, you, you want to you document them. Teach them to document the work. That's really important, too, in this day and age. Teach them to get pictures of their process, get pictures of their final product. Maybe you just want to make a bulletin board out of all the pictures that you have of their designs. Maybe you want to hang them from the ceiling. Maybe you want to put them in the hallway. Maybe you just want to make a, oh, maybe you want to use them as snowflakes in a collage on the background for a uh, winter scene, something. I don't know. Just ask them, maybe. Post them on your blog, on your website. They might have ideas of what to do with them. Do you have a Cricut or a Cameo? Do you have a 3D printer? Do you have a laser cutter? It is always great to get an actual physical version, especially for those kids who design something digitally. All of those design things have ways to export to cut them out on a Cricut, cut them out on a laser, 3D print them. 3D printing does take a little bit of time, but that's also why you don't do this. have this every kid do the same mode of design some kids will be designing and they're going to they're going to want stickers some kids are going to want the laser cutter some kids are going to want the 3d print so you can break up the variety they do variety different materials like the cricket and the cameo can do paper can do uh, cardboard as in cereal box cardboard food box cardboard it can also do different vinyl so they have stickers there's even iron on vinyl so you make t-shirts. 
laser cutter, does paper, does cardboard, does wood, does acrylic, and 3D printer, you know, um, with 3D printer. But it is important that they get their designs physical. We want that physical artifact. And maybe the kids will have ideas on what, how they want it to come out. Oh, you can you can paint 3D prints. Um, you can use LEDs. Oh, well, now we'll get the LEDs. You can use LEDs with the acrylic and make an edge-lit acrylic so it shines kind of thing. So why do we do all this? We just want to learn some concepts. Why do we go about all of these machinations? I believe that the design and making process gives us more time to have discussions. And that's where most of the learning happens, the best learning happens. And ask questions and to make connections. That's learning. We were dealing with content. We were dealing with each other, learning about each other. So it's multi-purposed. It gives the learner some autonomy and some control. They've got choices. They've got voice. They're doing something from them, for them, about them. So they're putting themselves into it. I think that's very, very important. Again, back to the emotion part of learning. It also gives them exposure to new tools and materials that they might need down the road. We don't know. But we're letting them see things. You never know what a tool can do until you actually get your hands on doing things. And you start by doing things simple. Snowflakes are pretty simple. And then you can learn what that tool does. It also helps them develop different skills and abilities that they're going to need to thrive in life. Perseverance is, is important and comes through this. How to pivot when things don't go as expected. Another important thing for them to do. But no matter what we want to call it, it's really just learning. And we were all about doing the learning. And that's why we did a maker-focused one. Because it really helps us do lear learning well. Anchors it, makes it stick, makes connections. Can have applications to uh, the real world. And I believe that maker, out of all of them, they have all these, you know kind of overlapping Venn diagram things. I think Maker encompasses the most of what we want for our kids. Dale Doherty is the founder of Make Magazine, which founded Maker Affairs. He has this awesome saying that we're all makers. So it's already a part of us. We are makers. We make mud pies as kids. We make things out of sticks. We make blanket forts. It's natural for us to create and make. We just need to give students the outlet to unleash their creative genius. I am trying to connect all the maker educators in Northeast Ohio, get us a network where we can share ideas, talk and help each other and expand some things. I have a blog going and I am looking for people to contribute ideas to it. Send me a message if you'd like to add something. It was great talking to you. Please contact me if you'd like to have more conversation and discussions and have questions about maker-centered learning, maker spaces, pretty much just maker in general. My email is paul at paulshercliffe.org. My Twitter is shirky17. Thank you for watching. Have a great day.